doesn't know me, my name is Julie. I work as a software developer in Lower Manhattan. And I'm writing a book on Java 8, which has gotten me intimately familiar with all the updates and all of the versions of Java. Um, first has big changes in store for us for next year. We're going to a new platform in RoboRio. And with that, we're going to Java 8 instead of Java 4. And we're also going to Java Standard Edition instead of Java Micro Edition, which means we can use pretty much the full power of Java instead of a short list of methods and classes, which is very cool. We're also switching to Eclipse, which I'm excited about because people use the Eclipse in the real world and not so much NetBeans. So you get to learn a useful skill. I have a blog and I'm a moderator at Codegram. I'm going to be putting this on SlideShare later, so it has the disclaimer that this is not a full list of all of the new features that have been added since Java 1.4. It's the ones that we're most likely to use on a first robotics team. I'm covering the non-micro APIs from 1.4 that I think we're most likely to use. Those aren't new, they've been around forever, but they're new to the robot being able to use them, and features in Java 5, 7, and 8. There were no features in Java 6 that are of any interest, so we're going to skip that. All right, so what's in Java 1.4? Right now, if you have a list of things, you're probably using an array, or you might be using a vector, which is available in Java ME. A vector is better than an array because it's dynamically sized, so you can just keep saying add without having to worry about array index out of bounds issues. The problem with vectors is that they're kind of slow. They were from Java, you know, the dawn of time. A long time ago, a vector was replaced with array list, which is a much faster way of doing the exact same thing. But now that we're using Java for real, we should be using array lists for our collections of stuff. It's still okay to use an array if you happen to know how many things are in it, but if you're doing logic where you need to expand it well, you don't want that extra logic to figure out, well, how big does my array need to be? Array list handles that for you. There's also a math class. Math is in micro edition, but it's a shorter math class. The full math class has a lot more methods in it. This is the kind of thing you don't really know in advance if you care about it. It's you know, I really needed a method that does a hyperbolic cosine. Now, I don't know why you'd want that because I don't remember what it is. It's been too long since calculus. But if there's a math function you want, check again to see if it's in the math library because maybe it will be useful. There's also a class called Java Util Properties. This one is really useful. It takes a file, file on disk, and it parses it for you. The file is in the format key equal value, and you just have many lines of keys and values. Properties reads that in and lets you refer to it with get methods, which are not on the slides or later on in the presentation. So I'll talk about that more later. All right, on to stuff that's actually new. Java 5. Java 5 introduced a concept called generics. You probably didn't miss this because you weren't using ArrayList before. But had you been, you would have missed it. In Java 4, you were able to stick anything you wanted in an array list, regardless of whether it was the right type or not. And then you were able to get that wrong type out and get an exception. Isn't that fun? In Java 5, they fixed that. When you create an array list, you get to specify the type of the array list. So here I'm saying I have a list of integers. I don't want to put anything in it that's not an integer. If I try to, don't let me. If I try to get anything out that's not the right type, don't let me. This is really good for everybody because we write a lot of code, but especially for new programmers, aka next year's freshmen, because it's easy to lose track of what's in your list. And if the compiler tells you, you don't have to worry about wasting all that time running the code, loading the code, and just finding out on the robot that this code is no good. The other thing that's new is called autoboxing. When we've been dealing with numbers, we've been using something called a primitive. A primitive, you can tell it's a primitive because it has a lowercase type. So int, double, long, boolean, those are all primitives. Starting in Java 5, Java can automatically, or magically, depending on your point of view, convert that into a real object, which means I can add one. It converts it to this big integer type, and everything goes just fine. I don't have to do anything special, which is pretty cool. Java introduced some syntactic sugar to make our code easier to write and read. Right now, if you want to loop through an array or an array list or whatever, you have to write this construct. And you probably know it by heart because you've written it so many times by now. But that's you. A new programmer hasn't written it so many times. So it's sitting there thinking, well, is this zero or is this one? Is this a less than or is this a less than equal? It has to be right. 
And even if you know how to write it, it's a lot of typing. Starting with Java 5, this is all you need to write. If you know any other languages, they look like this already. It just says, hey, loop through this. As you go through, store it in the variable and do whatever with it. It's a lot shorter, and more importantly, it's a lot harder to get wrong. Java 5 also introduced a feature called static imports. This one, I think, has a lot of use in robotics programs because most of us have either a class or an interface that has all of our ports or constants in it. That class, nothing but constants. And you notice that I left out the public static final. That's all redundant in an interface. All fields in an interface are public static and final. There's no need to type it. I like to leave it out because it's less visual clutter, but it's fine to put it in. So I've got my interface ports. And I used to have to say ports that right motor channel, ports that left motor channel, and so on and so forth, which made the code a little longer than it needed to be. In Java 5, I can say import static, ports that star. What that does is it imports all the static members from ports. And remember, these are all static even though it doesn't say so. Now I can refer to them as if they were defined in this class. This is the type of feature that if you use it too much, it makes the code difficult to read. If I'm doing a static import from 20 different classes, I have no idea where to look for anything. But if you have, like most of us do, one or two classes that have all of your constants in it, this is very helpful. On to Java 7. Remember, we're skipping Java 6. Java 7 has a new concept called the diamond operator, because it looks like a diamond. They realized after they introduced this new type in Java 5 that it's redundant that everybody is creating the same type over here and then they are over here. So they said, you know what, forget it, you don't have to write it, we can let it be implied. Underscores. I, I like this one and I think it's going to help us a lot. You can now use underscores in numbers. This is helpful if you have a long number. If my number is three, I'll grant you this isn't going to help me any. But if it's five or five million or you've got a number, decimals that go on forever, you can divide them with underscores. Don't divide them in random places, that will just add confusion. But adding an underscore where you would normally have a comma is helpful. It lets me see at a glance that that's 5,000 and not 500 or 50,000. And when I'm reading the code quickly in between matches, that's something that's going to be very helpful. Reading a file. I forgot to mention that you can interrupt me with questions at any time. Reading a file. Java wrote, came out with a way of reading a file way back at the beginning of Java. And they realized it wasn't such a good way. So they came up with a new way, and they named it new input output. It's kind of like a new science building, and it's a crappy name for things, because what happens when it's 20 years old? I remember being a kid taking swimming lessons when the new science building was new. That's a long time ago. So, they had the exact same problem that the new science building is going to have one day. That they, in Java 7, they came up with a better name, and the new I.O. was taken. So they said, okay, new I.O. 2. New I.O. 2 is now the way of doing input-output in Java. Isn't that awesome? Alright, but it's a lot easier. So it was worth it, and we'll forgive them the name. In Java, in older Java, like Java 4 or Java 6, if you wanted to read from a file, you used a file object. And you still can. But you can also now use a path object. To create a path object, you say paths.get and tell it where the path is. It's reasonably forgiving with this. You can give it a relative directory, an absolute directory. You can use various characters in it. This is actually called a factory, where you call another class and a static method on it, and it creates the object for you. You can't write new paths. You have to write paths.get in order to actually create a path object. The reason you need a path object is all of the new IO2 classes require a path object instead of a file object. You can do many things with an IO. We'll actually show some more at the end if there's extra time. One of the particularly useful ones is you can call this files method, files class. It has a number of utility methods in it. One of them is read all lines. It takes a path object, and it requires you to take to give it the character set. But you always can use the default character set because we're writing this program in English, and all of the English characters are in the default set. It then returns you one of those new array lists, or list, of strings. And then you can look through that list of strings and do whatever you want with it. 
So that's two lines in order to read in your file. It's a lot easier than it used to be. I don't know if any of you actually used a file in FRC programming, but it's a good idea because it lets you change your code quickly without having to reload the entire program and externalize some of the values. The other thing that's interesting is now that we're on real Java, we get to use open source libraries that work on real Java and didn't work on micro edition. One of my favorites is called Commons, Apache Commons IO. It has a number of helper methods in the space of files. One of them is it can read a file object to a string. That's the old style file object, so you do a new file in the name of the location. It puts it all in one string for you. So if you have multiple lines, you probably want to use this approach. If you have one value on one line, you probably want to use this approach. But I think this is really helpful and it's short and it's hard to get wrong. They also introduced something called try with resources. Up until now, if you wanted to read a file, or pretty much do anything in Java that could go wrong. You had to open the file, you had to have a local variable that was set to null, and then you had to finally block where you had to check if it was not null, in case it blew up, and then close it. And if you didn't do that, you'd have a resource leak and your program would get slower and slower over time and eventually declare to be. In Java 7, they introduced a shorter way of doing this, so you don't have to deal with the close and getting the pattern exactly right. You put what you want to close later in parentheses. So try in this mess of stuff, and that's it. When Java gets here to the end of the block, it says, oh, the try with resources is complete. If anything's open, I'll close it for you, and if it's not open, I won't. Problem solved. This is that property file thing I was talking about before. You create a property object, you load using this magic string. That's the way to do it in Java. You just copy it. And then from that point on, you can call properties that get property and you can get all of those values in the file. Maybe you're doing PID tuning and you've got three different values in the file. You can get all three of them by calling get property three times. So if you have one of those uh, properties files uh, objects in like a global scope, you have to still explicitly close it yourself. <laughs> You wouldn't need to close it yourself because it would go out of scope at the end of the program and then you wouldn't care about a resource leak. Yeah. If you were opening and closing it multiple times, you'd care because eventually you'd run out of file descriptors. Mm -hmm. But you're correct, if you have it once in the program, you're fine. That's a good question. Java 8. Java 8 introduces a whole new world of programming. And it's one that, for the most part, we're not going to be able to use next year. Because in order to use the Java 8 way of programming, you need a library that works with Java 8. First has already gone on the record of saying, for a couple of years, they are going to try to keep backward compatibility with the existing libraries. They haven't guaranteed it. And there'll probably be a couple changes, like there are every year. But they're not planning on doing the complete overhaul of the command-based structure or the simple robot structure. That said, you could still use it in your own code if you choose to. It's a trade-off that each team is going to need to make for themselves. If you know other languages like Ruby, it looks a lot like that. If you don't, that's probably not a helpful analogy. The way it looks is you start using this new syntax. This is a new operator in Java. And it creates a class for you. Thread is a class in Java. It has one method, which is run. It's used when you want to run something in the background. And now that we have two CPUs, we will want to run things in the background so that one of them isn't sitting around idle. You could create a new thread class as a full-fledged class with its implementation of the one method and pass that around. That's the older way of doing it, and it's fine. The newer way of doing it is to do it all on one line. This says create a new thread object, implement its one method that doesn't take any parameters, this is an empty parameter list, even though it's just empty parentheses. And then with that parameter of nothing, print out food. That's all that does. And it creates a thread object as if you had created it in a class. <laughs> this is useful when you start using Java APIs or APIs that support Java 8 that take this set of syntax. If you're just creating a thread, you could have done it in a class. Is that what the arrow it's like a mapping operator. It's a take these parameters and then apply. So in this example, take the parameters A and B, 
and then sort of with them, subtract the two lengths. Groovy does this a lot. In Groovy, when you're writing code, it, it's basically a string of code that looks like this. If you're using Java 8 APIs, they take this new, um, it's called a closure or a lambda. You, it takes it embedded. So I can say word step sort, sort my two things by the length, so I get the longest strings in my list first. Sort is a full-fledged Java API that you can use that has nothing to do with first. I'm going to make a note to go back to Java 8 at the end if there's more time, because I think there's interest in it, but I also know that if I start talking about it now, I could talk about it for an hour and then we won't get to the interesting things. So remember that we have two CPUs now. It's a good time to start thinking about, well, what can we do with that second CPU? We could use it for vision. We could continually be looking at the target or goal or whatever we're shooting at next year and see when we're aligned and send us a message. It could be used for logging. Up until now, we've been very conservative with our logging because file I.O. is expensive and you don't want to slow down your robot because you're writing to a file. But if you were to dedicate your second CPU to it, you could start a new thread. Remember, we just saw that you can start threads. And in your second thread, you could have it do nothing but log the state of affairs constantly so that you have a record of everything that happened during the match. That's something that could hypothetically be used in order to record how far you need to go for things and um, use that recording to create a better autonomous. If you happen to have long-running calculations, which usually occur in vision, but if you're doing anything very complex that easy takes a long time, you could farm that out to another thread. You could pull a sensor. A lot, of, a lot of years we need to be on the line in order to do something. You could have that one thread just continually checking if we're on the line instead of bullying when we get there. Use your imagination. I'm sure there's plenty of things that I haven't thought of that can be done in that second thread, but I'm very excited that we have it now so we can start seeing what teams do with it. All right, installing Java. When you install Java, you go to this website, and you're installing Java just like regular people do now. We're not looking for a special version of Java. So you just go to, to download whatever the latest version of Java 8 is. Right now it's update 5. Every quarter they come, possibly more, but at least every quarter they come out with a new updated version of Java. So just pick whichever is the latest at that time. They're usually security enhancements and minor bug fixes. There's two places you can download it from. This takes you to the exact same place. Make sure you download the JDK and not the JRE, just like always, you need the JDK to compile. And make sure that you download the one that doesn't include NetBeans, because NetBeans is very large and there's no reason to be using a bowl of that bandwidth of memory for something that we no longer need. Okay. This Q&A, the first one actually came from Danny. I sent an email to our team saying that I'm going to be covering versions, and I was basically told that, you know, but that doesn't make sense, it doesn't count. So the way Java counts is 1-1, one, 1-2, one, 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 And somebody in marketing decided that they didn't want to be on version 1 forever, so they were just going to drop the 1 and count as if it wasn't there. But if you type Java version at the command line, it still tells you you're on 1.7 or 1.8. So the 1 didn't actually go anywhere. This is a complete marketing thing. And when I say blame marketing, I mean blame Oracle marketing, not the marketing people on your team. <laughs> And what's the difference between Java Micro Edition that we've been using up until now and the small memory version that's going to be starting next year? Java Micro Edition is how they used to do Java for small devices. It hardly had any APIs and had a very small memory footprint. Since then, cell phones and embedded devices got far larger, so they realized they weren't going to do that anymore. At championships, they said we're going to be using the small memory footprint version of Java. There is no such thing as that, so what I assume they meant is the compact profile, which is the one that uses the least memory. I looked last night at what compact profile has in it, and it has in it everything you could possibly want to use. It leaves out things like databases and communicating with native programs and stuff that we'd never be doing on our robot anyway. Okay, how do I install Eclipse? You want to install Eclipse Luna, which is version 4.4 of Eclipse. It doesn't actually exist yet. It comes out on June 25th. It's currently in release candidate stages. When you go to the Eclipse website, you've probably got about a dozen choices of which version of Eclipse that you want to download. What they do for Eclipse is they give you standard Eclipse, which contains pretty much everything you need, 
And then they had versions of Eclipse with other things. A version of Eclipse if you're developing a web application, version of Eclipse if you're doing reporting, version of Eclipse if you're doing C++. We're doing Java, which means we can use the standard Eclipse. The standard Eclipse has everything you are reasonably expected to need in it, and it's the smallest one. I recommend using that. If you don't want to use that one, there's also Eclipse IDE for Java developers. That one's also fine. It uses it adds things like Maven, which is similar to Ant, but different. So we're using Ant, so you don't need that. And there's a few other changes like that. I'm mentioning it because it has the word Java in the name, so it's easy to look at it and say, Java, that's what I need. And it's fine. There's nothing wrong with using it, but you could use standard as well, which is going to use a little more memory on your machine. I'm harping on memory because Eclipse is a memory hog. Not that Nebians isn't a memory hog, but Eclipse is also a memory hog. And I know at least at Stuyvesant, a lot of our laptops don't have a lot of memory, so it's good to use a smaller version if you can, which is the Eclipse Standard Edition. I've got the two URLs here. I recommend waiting until June 25th because it's soon, and then you'll get the official version that you don't need to upgrade. But if you are itching to do a download right now, it's available as a release candidate. Can I use an older version of Eclipse? You can. The version of Eclipse that's out now, which is called Kepler, supports Java 7 and below. It doesn't support the Java 8 constructs. And when the actual Eclipse plugins for FRC come out, it's likely that they'll only support Luna because it's the latest version. So what's so special about June 25th that I keep talking about? Eclipse releases on an annual schedule, in particular the fourth Wednesday of June of every year. They do this because Eclipse, like NetBeans, uses a lot of plugins, and they all need to work together. However, in NetBeans' world, all the plugins are supplied by one company, so it's very easy to release them together. You collect everything, and when you're done, you say, here's the release of NetBeans. With Eclipse, most of the plugins are open source, and you don't have that control. What they did to compensate for that was say, we're going to have an annual release train, and if you want to be in that release train, you will be done by the fourth Wednesday of June of every year. That's worked very well together. They, they do create a set of plugins that actually work together and release, and it's a very exciting day. Every year, at the end of June, or more realistically, the early July, I download the official version, not the release candidate, the official version, and I create a blog entry about the new features. So if you're curious about Kepler or Juno, you can check it out on Celicop.net. The last three releases came out in June, as we expect. Notice how their code names go JKL. This is intentional. They started doing this about five years ago where they picked a name that had to do with science or space and used a code word with that letter, which is nice because it lets us talk about it using the names. When you look online, you'll see more people will actually be talking about Eclipse Kepler than Eclipse 4.3. There's also the version numbers, 4243444. Unlike Java, they do on occasion increment the major version. About four years ago, we were on three. And the version of Java supported. It so happens that the last three releases did increment the version of Java, six, seven, eight, but that depends on how often Java is released, not when Eclipse is released. They do generally support the latest version of Java at the time of release. Has anyone here seen Eclipse before? Okay, so this might be too basic, but we'll cover it anyway. And I do have some tips in here that you may not have seen. Eclipse organizes everything by perspectives. A perspective is a set of views. The main perspectives that we're going to be using for FRC programming are the Java perspective, which shouldn't be a surprise because we're writing Java code. The resource perspective, which shows you what's on the file system. The Java view hides some things from you from the file system, and it also reorganizes things for you. It's like, oh, well, you have settings. But rather than show them to you where they are on the file system, I'm going to show them to you in the settings folder to make them easier to find. If you want to know what things actually look like, you check the resource folder or the file system for that matter. There's also, there might be an FRC perspective. It's hard to tell because the only time there was ever an, it wasn't even official. There was an experimental plugin in 2011 for Eclipse when they were last considering Eclipse, so I use that in my testing. And then after that, it never went anywhere. It doesn't really work anymore. And people said if they wanted to use Eclipse, they just had to use AMP directly. But next year, there's going to be a real plugin again. And when there is, they may have an FRC perspective to put all the views you need together in one place. But if they don't, that's okay. You just use the Java perspective and you do everything there. 
In order to open a perspective, you click on this little plus. It gives you a list of all the perspectives that are available to you. You pick the one you want, and it starts showing up here. Once you have more than two perspectives, you quickly run out of room there. You can right click those names and show it in a smaller fashion. And then you just see the icons, but you see more of them there. You have to switch between perspectives a lot. Incidentally, there's also a subversion and a get perspective. So regardless of which version control you're using, you'll probably have another perspective that you deal with frequently. I'm taking notes so I can update the presentation before I put it online. There's also a team synchronization perspective, which is cut off here. The difference between the two is when you're connecting to a repository for the first time, you use the Git or the Subversion perspective. When you're synchronizing with a repository to do a commit, you use the Team Synchronize perspective. The nice thing is you don't have to remember that. You do have to remember that you go to the Subversion or Git perspective the first time to connect to the repository, but to actually update your code, you just right-click the project and say, I want to synchronize and see if there's any updates and do my commit. Eclipse views. We said perspectives are made up of views. Well, what are views? They're like little windows. They're, they're sections of your page. You can expand them. You can close them. The most common ones that we're going to be using in FRC are the Package Explorer. That's where your Java code lives. The Problems view. What compiler errors do I have? Because there's no point loading to the robot if the code doesn't compile. The Tasks view, which um, does not appear by default, but is good to add. Eclipse has a feature that if you add a comment that begins with to do, it automatically shows up as a task. It's a very convenient way to see, well, what remains in the program. That, okay, well, we were writing code and we don't know what channel we're using for our motor, so we're just going to write to do, find out what channel it is. And then we can quickly look and see, oh, well, these are the things that still remain to be done before we run this code. There's also the console that's used for output. In order to add any of these views, and you can add any view to any perspective, just go to Windows, Show View, and Console. The perspectives are just pre-grouped views so that you don't have to go look for everything yourself. You wouldn't want to open Eclipse and say, well, I need to find the Java editor. That wouldn't be a very good way to start the day. But you can personalize this in any way you want, and you can even save perspectives. If you find out something that your team likes, create it, set it as a perspective, you can even give it a name. Now, I talked about this problems view. I'm not a fan of the default settings that Eclipse uses for its problems view. So the first thing I do whenever I open an Eclipse workspace is I change it. The first thing I do is I click on this little tiny triangle here that's hard to notice, and you might not even know exists. When I do this pops up, I select all four of these, which is all combinations of errors and warnings, and then I choose on selected element and its children. The reason I do that is I want to be able to click on a project or a package and see all of the errors in it. Eclipse defaults to showing you all of the errors in the whole workspace, which is less than convenient, because often you'll have two projects checked out in your workspace. The one you're working on, which you care greatly whether it has any compiler errors in it, and another one that you're using as a reference. You know, maybe you got it from the internet, who knows? But if there's a good chance it doesn't compile and you don't want to pollute your problems view with things from it, you want to have your problem view always be clean to make sure that, oh, there's a compiler in my project, I fix it right away. So I highly recommend this setting. My next tip is how to save a launch configuration. We all know how to run an AMP build because we've been doing it in NetBeans. In Eclipse, they have a similar technique. You click run as um, ant or, or FRC build or deploy if they give us special names for it. A window pops up. And you have a whole variety of choices of preferences. You can see there's several tabs worth of stuff. Maybe you want a system variable, your team number, the time of day, I don't know. Anything you want. What you can do is you can save those settings. When you save the settings, you give it a name, and you click on shared file. That creates a file with that name in your project, or the location of your choosing. But it's good to put it in your project. Because if you put it in your project, you can commit it to Subversion or Git and have it be available to everyone who's using the project, which is convenient. Now I can have different launch configurations to build the same project. So build in debug mode, build with unit tests. Um, you know, I'm in a hurry, just do the bare minimum, anything you want. The other thing that's good about having names is you can have launch configurations for different environments. 
Maybe you have one really old laptop that has something installed in the wrong location because it's old and funky. You can create a lunch configuration for lunch configuration for our crappy laptop. And then when you're building on that laptop, you use a different lunch configuration. Everyone has one. Um, than when you're doing builds normally. Maybe you have a different lunch configuration for a Mac. Ideally, you won't have any differences because everything will be a relative path, but there's always something that's different about a machine. And at least you don't have to remember it. You can store it in version control where it's available to everybody. Eclipse autocomplete. This is why I have trouble remembering what the Nepean's autocomplete shortcut is. It's because it's different. But it's time to start learning that in Eclipse, it's control space. You start typing. You do control space. Pop-up comes up with your list of choices. And there's two different things you're going to see in the list. One of them is the classes or methods or fields or whatever you're trying to autocomplete to. And the other is these, which are templates. They allow, they set up automatically and allow you to set up more of your own common templates for common patterns. So you write a for each loop all the time. That's that new syntax I was talking about. But maybe you haven't used it a lot of times before and you don't know it by heart. Or maybe you're just a lazy typist. You type in the word for, you do autocomplete. You mouse over this, and it shows you what it's going to generate. OK, that looks like what I want. Send, good. I actually use this in the real world when I'm doing mock testing, because the syntax is ugly. So I created my own template where I type the word mockery, autocomplete, and it generates about this much boilerplate code for me, which is pretty cool. So if you see something that you're doing a lot or is particularly hard for the new students, you can set up a template for them to make it easier. Now we're going to show some screenshots of the FRC plugin. Remember that this is not the plugin that we're going to actually be using. This is the one from 2011 that was experimental. I did not actually succeed in getting the plugin to work. So some of the screenshots are from my machine and some of them are from the manual. And part of that is because it's so old. It wasn't meant to be used with this version of Eclipse and it wasn't meant to be used with the latest libraries. But it was enough that I could get a feel for what was going on. So I don't recommend installing this because I'm just going to have to uninstall it when the real version comes out. All right, how to install a plugin. This is how to install any plugin in Eclipse, so it's good to know. You go to help install software, you type in the URL of the plugin, or more realistically, you copy and paste in the URL of the plugin so that it's actually correct. You click add and you give it a name. Try to give it a useful name so that you can identify it later. I named mine FRC old so that I don't accidentally use it next year thinking that it's the FRC plugin. It then searches the internet very briefly, so remember you need internet for this proceeding, and sees what is available in that update site. In the FRC site there was only one plugin available, so I only had one choice, but if you're downloading an open source plugin sometimes there'll be more choices and you'll need to pick what you want. You then click a series of next except licenses, yeah, 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 finish. It then uses the internet extensively to download the plugin. On my home machine, it took a minute and a half to do this. On school internet, it will probably take longer. This is a screenshot of what I was showing. So I entered the repository name, I chose what I wanted, and then I proceeded. Next is configuring your plugin. This they did a good job on. They made configuring the plugin just like configuring anything else. In Eclipse, you have two levels of preferences. You have workspace preferences, which are top level and apply to every project in your workspace. And you also have project preferences that, as you might imagine, just point to one project. So you go to the workspace preferences, and you enter your team number, and you're done. They made that pretty easy for us. I did note that the preferences are in a different location based on your operating system. On Windows and Linux, there's a Windows pull-down that has a preferences link. And uh, I'm over here, but wrong way. It's roughly on this part of the screen. On a Mac, it's Eclipse preferences, which is roughly on this part of the screen. Get used to that pretty quickly. Okay, creating a new project. Just like in Nepians, we want to create a new project. And they created the project types, also just like Nepians, that I can say what type of project I wanted. This was. And they also had the demo code that they had given us back in 2011 for NetBeans as well. This is interesting to me that they only have the two main robot classes, but they don't have any command stuff here because then as you proceed, command stuff does show up. It was an inconsistent mess of things in this plugin, which is probably why it doesn't work. 
So when you're in the project itself, if you write clip, it created options where, oh, I can create a command that can create a subsystem. And while it doesn't work on my computer, I'm sure that they're going to make this a lot better before they give the beta plugin out because this is something that's very integral. They've been pushing command-based programming for years. So how do I run my build? We know what to do in NetBeans, right? Push the big green button, and then you wait. In Eclipse, there's two ways to do it. One is you can click this little triangle here, do run as, and choose FRC build. I couldn't find anything in the docs that said the difference between build and deploy, but I assume build means compile and package, and deploy means FTP. That, that would make sense. The other way you can do it is to click the run menu, and then the same thing. You might notice here that this little red blob here and not here, those are different, and they run different types of things. The one with the little red blob is called external tools. Ant is an external tool. If you want to run Ant, you have to use this. FRC is going to continue using Ant again next year. If you want to run a Java program, you use the one without the little red blob. In NetBeans, the compiler uses Ant for everything. If you actually look at how NetBeans is set up, there's a build XML file. And if you've tried to read it, it's really hard to read because it delegates to NetBeans for everything and it's really long. But NetBeans is using that in order to build everything that there is to build. Eclipse doesn't work that way. Eclipse uses its own files called class path files in order to tell it where the jars are. So we're going to have two things to set up the project. There's going to be the class path, which says, OK, this is where you find the sunspot SDK. Ideally, that will be an absolute path. In practice, I suspect it won't, which may be why we need those launch configurations. The other thing you could do is you can set up a variable for the Sunspot SDK. I'm actually going to add a slide on that because that would be helpful. A variable says, well, on each machine in Eclipse, we're going to set up the location of something. And then in the project, we're just going to point to that variable so the project doesn't care about where things are installed. I want to do some live demos in Eclipse, but before I do that, is there anything anybody would like to hear more about or no? So with the, I'm just trying to get my head around the Java syntax. So this new thread with the arrow up there, if you wanted to do multi-threading with that, what was the empty method? Okay. Um, is it okay to write on here? Absolutely. Can people see if I write on here, or is the whiteboard in the way? No, of course. Okay. So the way threading used to work is you created the new thread object, and then you implemented the run method, and then you called t.start, and it would kick that off in the background. Um, remember that this method is called run, and this method is called start. This is actually very important. It will, Java will let you call run here because there's a run method, but if you call run, it won't run it in the background. It will make you sit around and wait until it's done, which defeats the entire point of using threads. So th this works, and you can continue to do this. The problem they were trying to solve is this is ugly. So if I wanted to implement this run method, public void run um, system out print line, whatever, right? This is a lot of code, so you can replace this entire four lines of code with this one line. That's what Java 8 is buying you. So it's not giving you any new functionality, it's just giving you a shorter way of doing things. This part is giving you more functionality because they've added more methods. So let's say you wanted to go through a list and find all of the elements that, I don't know, begin with the letter A. You'd have to write a loop to do it, right? In Java 8, you can have list.collect. Collect is a new method. Collect says, go through the list and find me what I care about. And then you can say, OK, well, I want to collect the things with what a, one parameter where char add equal. I forgot what I said I wanted to begin with, so maybe B. And it's doing that whole loop for you. It's saying, OK, I'm going to collect things. For each of those things, I randomly name my parameter something so I can refer to it and see if they begin with the letter B. And the 
point of functional programming is that it lets you chain this. So you can do a lot of things like this. I can collect the things that begin with the character B, and then I can find the largest one, and it, it just you can have a whole chain of commands. I can't imagine us needing to do that in FRC programming next year, because it really does work better when you have libraries that go with it. Um, the only reason I could think that this might be useful is if you have a complex algorithm to do something, maybe an autonomous, and you want to call a lot of the Java native libraries directly, then maybe it would be helpful to chain stuff. But even though this is the coolest feature to me because it has so much potential for Java, I don't think it's the most important feature for FRC, unfortunately, next year. Other questions? And see actual eclipse. Eclipse preferences. And notice there's a lot of choices here. Eclipse has a nice feature that I don't think NetBeans has where you can filter it. So if I know what I want, maybe I want variables, I can type in variables. I guess this is going to be a short demo. Um, you can type in variables and you can go to the right section and see, um, okay, well, I have class path variables here. I can give them a name. I can give them a location. And then on each machine, it gets a different location. And on my project, I can click on the build path and choose to add a variable. I can also choose to have on my build path I should have brought the charger. I didn't think I needed it for such a short time. So this is the project properties I was talking about. I can go to Java build path, and I can say I want to add a variable. I refer to those variables that I just defined. So I see that as something being useful for the Sunspot SDK. The other thing I can do with variables that are useful, either for my own or the built-in ones, a variable can point to a directory. So I can say, well, I want something in the Eclipse home directory. I can extend that, and I can say, well, I want a specific plugin in that directory. There's actually some first stuff in here, which is kind of cool, so I can count the project or something. That way, when I have Eclipse installed in different locations on all of my different computers, I don't have to worry about it. I can say that, well, just worry about where the Eclipse directory is. Each workspace will tell the project that, and the project can proceed normally. got samples of all of the code that I showed here. So to run a program, if I'm running a Java program, I get to run it as a Java application. And the file doesn't exist because I made it up, so that was a dead one to use. And if I want to run an AMP program, I do run as external tool configuration. And in my case, I picked a launch configuration to show as an example, which is nice. I can also edit all of my launch configurations. Remember, there's, there's copious amounts of settings I can choose here. So I can say what target I want to run. That's something that's very common in AMP, but I only want to run specific targets, so I can check them off. I can pass parameters. In my case, I pass my name as the system parameter. I have multiple projects. In this case, I have one project, but I can add as many projects as I want. Eclipse does not have the concept of a main project that NetBeans had. So if you're running something, you have to see what you're actually selecting before you run it to make sure that you're running the right thing. So I had talked about perspectives before. The subversion and Git perspectives look remarkably similar to each other. So you, when you're dealing with them, you can create a new repository and you type in the URL of your repository, you type in your credentials, and same thing as if you were doing this at the command line, except that it's here. You can still use command line with Eclipse. So for Git, they do offer you the ability to actually integrate with Eclipse and Git in the IDE, but nobody does that. Because if you're using Git, you like the command line. So you just point your command line to your Eclipse workspace and have it commit from there. The other thing is you don't actually have to keep your project in the workspace. They have this concept of an external project. So you can keep your project, your Eclipse projects anywhere on your hard drive that you want. 
and just point to them from Eclipse. And they'll show up here just as if they were real Eclipse projects that you had created in Eclipse in the first place. So that's nice when you check something out, you can keep everything in your documents directory regardless of where Eclipse is. I'm afraid to ask if anyone wants to see anything in particular because I'm sure my computer will crash at that exact moment. Do you have Eclipse? Yes. Thank you, Danny. Did you bring your charger? Oh, I have.
Deleting a plugin is a pain in the neck. Clips has made this extremely difficult, which is why I find it easier to just clean house once a year with each new version of Eclipse than actually uninstall everything. In order to uninstall a plugin, you typically have to find the files on disk and delete them. And if you don't do that right, you corrupt the plugin and then it just works half, which is not what you want. So I would just recommend this clean house approach, but you could upgrade by remembering your plugins. Is the part plugin stored inside the Eclipse folder? Yes. They, they are. In the Eclipse folder that you launched from, there is a plugins directory, and it has in it all the plugins. And I can actually show that here, because when you have the variable that I was showing before, extend. This is your Eclipse home directory. On the Mac, it was in Applications Eclipse, but you can put it anywhere you want. This is what's in your Eclipse directory. The plugins is where most of the plugins are. There's some folders, and there's also loose jar files. There's also features, which is why it's complicated to just delete a plugin, because some plugins are split between the plugins directory and the feature directory, so you have to delete both in order to successfully delete the plugin. That's a good question. Is there anything else in particular anyone would like to see in Eclipse? Do you still have the 2011 plugin button? I have that on my machine, but since Joel brought the electricity, I can show that. It, I have to warn you that it's not particularly impressive because... I don't think I can use this. It's actually a newer version. Yeah. My machine's old. That's an old machine, too. It, it appears wider than me. Yeah, that's one of the... That's one of Oh. Don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, um, it, it didn't work, so I can't tell you it was very impressive. I, I, I can tell you what worked about it. I was able to install the plugin. That that went extremely smoothly. In fact, that was the best part of the process. I was able. I was not able to go to the file new project and see the FRC project types, which is why nothing else worked after that, because that sort of set up the path and the prerequisites for everything else. I was able to right-click a project and see the add command, add subsystem, etc. Um, functions, but clicking on them didn't do anything, invariably because I didn't have a project. And I was able to see the run as FRC build and FRC deploy, which again didn't do anything because I didn't have a project. I didn't really expect this to work, I just tried it to see how far I would get. I, I mean, I have great confidence that the beta and the real one will actually work. And part of that is because plugins are designed to work with specific versions of Eclipse. So if I still had my Eclipse from four years ago, it would probably have worked. Anything else anyone would like to see? Okay, well, I was targeting this to take an hour, and it took 56 minutes, so that's <laughs> good. I'll hang around for another five minutes or so if anyone